Jesus always commissioned his disciples to preach the gospel and cast out demons. And you see all through the gospels, uh, Matthew chapter 10, Mark chapter 6, Luke chapter 9 and 10, and Matthew, Mark chapter 16, um, you see that he always sent them out. Whenever he sent them out to preach the gospel, he always sent them out to cast out demons. At the end of Mark, he sent them out before he ascended up to heaven. He sent them out to preach the gospel, heal the sick, cast out demons. Jesus started his disciples off on the right program, and he never made any provision for it to be changed. He began the right way, and he never needed to improve on it. Any evangelism that does not include the casting out of demons is not New Testament evangelism. I also add that it's very unscriptural to pray for the sick if one is not prepared to cast out demons. Jesus didn't separate one from another. Often in our Western society, we've developed a very anti-supernatural view, and it's kept us from recognizing the reality of demons. We know in other areas of the world where it's steeped in idolatry and um, occult, we know it's clearly demonic there. But I'm going to say it's, it's no different here. The only difference is we have a humanistic prejudice which has blinded us to it and made it easier for the demons to operate undetected. Some people say it's all right to cast out demons, but don't do it in public where it disturbs people. But the interesting thing is there's nothing Jesus did more regularly and consistently in public than drive out demons. There is not a single instance in which he took a person aside in private for this purpose. This aspect of his ministry excited more public attention than any other. Apparently, he was not concerned that those who needed deliverance might be deterred by embarrassment. I don't believe we should try and improve on the methods of Jesus. And the purpose, it says in Acts 26.18, is to open their eyes, turning them from darkness to light, from the power of Satan to God, not confining deliverance in a corner. There are two important spiritual truths in this. The first is it brings right out into the open that there are two kingdoms. There's the kingdom of God and the kingdom of Satan. It brings it right out in the open for everyone to see, opens their eyes, not hidden anymore. And the second truth is it displays that the kingdom of Jesus Christ is far superior to the kingdom of Satan. Satan does not want that to be seen. The question is, who's changed? Has Jesus changed? We know he's the same yesterday, today, and tomorrow. Have the demons changed? Have they gone off and hidden somewhere? I don't think so. It's the church that's changed. And that's disturbing because we're off track because I don't see much deliverance being done in the churches. We have the first account. I don't have, I don't have time to read through Scripture, so I'm just going references. Mark chapter 1, 21 to 28. Jesus was in a synagogue and he was teaching. And when he was teaching, a man started to manifest demons. And he started to cry, you, I know who you are. You're the Holy One, the Son of God. And Jesus commanded them to be quiet and come out of the man. And they said, we, they said, we know who you are. There's several things. First, Jesus dealt with the demons and not the man. Second of all, Jesus expelled the demons from the man, not the man from the synagogue. Third, Jesus was no way embarrassed by the interruption or disturbance. Dealing with demons was a part of his total ministry. Next, the demons spoke both in the singular and the plural forms. You will very rarely find one demon on its own in a person. Often there'll be groups. They operate in groups. The man was a regular member of the synagogue, but apparently no one knew he needed deliverance from a demon. Perhaps the man himself didn't know. Often you don't even realize if you have demons until the power and anointing of the Holy Spirit drives them right out into the open. Next, later on that day, it was, the end of the, it was on the Sabbath, at the end of the Sabbath, when everyone could move freely, they came to his door and it says he healed the sick and he cast out many demons. Many demons, not just a few, many. And we've got to ask, what kind of people were Jesus ministering to? He said he traveled throughout all the synagogues preaching the gospel and casting out demons. They were primarily observant Jews who met every Sabbath in the synagogue and spent the rest of their week caring for their families, tending their fields, fishing the sea, and minding their shops. They were mainly normal, respectable, religious people. Moral and ethical code of the Jewish people in his time was under the law of Moses. They generally lived far more holy lives than most of the people in Western society and even in the church. And that's very similar to the people found in the Christian community today. Satan's objective is to invade both the body of the believer and the unbeliever. His first objective is to stop you becoming a Christian, 
And the second one is to stop you becoming an effective Christian. If he can bind you up so you can't freely move, if he can defile the temple of the Holy Spirit, often he does that through sex outside of marriage, fornication, smoking, addictions, all those sorts of things, he can quench the anointing of the Holy Spirit working through you. Being a Christian does not automatically protect you. On the contrary, demons view Christians as their primary target for attack. Throughout the Gospels, it talks about people being demon-possessed. That's not a correct translation from the Greek. It means to have a demon or to be under the influence of a demon. So you can belong to Jesus, but be bound up by demons in various areas of your life. Luke 13, he had a woman again in a synagogue. She had a bent back, and he, instead of praying for healing, he cast a demon out of her, and her back straightened up. I've experienced that in Fiji. A guy had a stroke. We were praying for healing, getting nowhere. I commanded a demon to come out. He straight away manifested, coughed out all this white junk, and then his arms started working. No problem at all. That's right. It says in Galatia, and at the end afterwards, the Pharisees complained. They said, but it's the Sabbath. You can't do that. And Jesus said, but she's a daughter of Abraham. She's been bound for 18 years. Shouldn't she be loosed? says in Galatians that those who are of faith and those who are in Christ are children of Abraham. In other words, it is possible for you to be a child of Abraham through faith in Jesus and still be bound up by demons. Basically, Jesus paid for everything at the cross. Everything was achieved, paid in full. He disarmed principalities and powers, making a public spectacle of them. He bore our sins on the cross. In Matthew chapter 8, when Jesus, many people came to him having demons cast out and healing the sick, it quotes Isaiah 53. It says he bore our pains and our sicknesses. That passage is about the cross. It's the only basis you can be delivered from demonic spirits is what Jesus did on the cross. He paid for eternal life. He paid for physical healing and sickness. It's on the same basis you get physical healing. It's the same basis you receive deliverance from demonic spirits. Everything's done at the cross, but often you hear, and, and he became a curse for us. But often you hear people say, but wait a second. If Jesus did everything at the cross, then how can it be that I'm a Christian and I have demons? They should leave as soon as I become a Christian. I put my faith in him. It says in Hebrews 10, 14, that by one sacrifice, he's perfected forever those who are being sanctified. He's perfected, it's done, complete. The word sanctified in the Greek is in this progressive tense. In other words, becoming holy is a stage-by-stage appropriation. Jesus did it all at the cross, but laying hold of it is another thing altogether. The question is, should we cast demons out of non-Christians? Jesus had a Canaanite woman come up to him in Matthew chapter 15. She was outside the covenant agreement with Israel, and she wanted a demon cast out of her daughter. Jesus said something that was quite blunt. He said some very disturbing things at times, but he said it's not right to give children's bread to the dogs. Dogs was a term for people outside covenant with God. They were Gentiles. It was when she said, Lord, even the dogs get the scraps. That's when Jesus said, how great is your faith? Your daughter's been delivered. So the only basis, basically deliverance from demons, is an extension of eternal salvation. It is a blessing that is exclusively for those who are children of Abraham through faith in Jesus. Hallelujah. And furthermore, when a demon leaves a person, it goes, it says in Matthew 12, it goes into dry places seeking rest, can't find any, goes and finds seven demons worse than itself, says, I'll go back to my first home, to the person. Finds the person swept and clean, their life's all cleaned up, but it finds them empty. Jesus said, Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone comes to the door, I'll come into him and dine with him and he with me. They must make Jesus Christ Lord of their life or they'll be in a worse state than ever, and you can prevent it by making sure they're willing to give their life to Jesus beforehand. And then finally, how common is it for Christians to have demons? I'm going to quote some very great deliverance ministers on their views on this and their experience after ministering to thousands of people. Derek Prince, he would often have someone call him up and it would be some lady saying something like, Mr. Prince, I need your help. My husband has demons. And his response would be, calm down, lady. Most husbands have demons. <laughs> And he would say most wives have demons too. In fact, he said the majority of Christians have demons. Bill Sabritsky in his seminar on moving in the power of the Holy Spirit would have had all the passionate Christians there. He said about 80% of people in, this, in these sorts of seminars need deliverance. And then finally Frank Hammond said, people think I see a demon behind every bush. And he said, it's not true. I see six or seven behind every bush. <laughs> 
Demons operate in groups, as I've established, and you'll get several groups within a person, and they'll affect a different area each. Over each group is what you call a ruling spirit, or a strong man. And within that person, you've got the principal strong man, which is the main spirit in that person's life. You can get a spirit reoccur throughout different groups. You can get a lying spirit in one group, and then it could be also in the other group. So you can have more than one lying spirit in you, or more than one spirit of lust, etc. You get varying degrees of authority in Satan's kingdom. You can get a strong man over a person, over a family, over a church, over a city, over a nation, and over entire sections of society. So they go in descending orders. It says, We contend not against flesh and blood, but against principalities and powers in the heavenlies. Heavenlies, it means heaven, but more than one heaven. It's plural. And so you get demons that operate on the earthly level, the individual ones, and then you get higher-ranking demons operating on the heavenly level, not in the third heaven. They've been kicked out of the presence of God out of that heaven, but they still operate in the second heaven. And they rule over entire cities, nations, etc., over territories, and the small demons and people receive their instructions from those higher-ranking ones. So what Jesus said is you cannot plunder a house, and he's talking about deliverance, unless you bind the strong man. So what we do is we bind the main, so we identify the main strong man operating in the heavens and bind it so the demons can't receive that instruction. Often when many deliverance ministers go to cities, they'll identify the strong man over a city. Um, any spirit can be a strong man on any level. You pride, a spirit of jealousy, Leviathan, who's the king of the children of pride. You can get Jezebel, humanism, all sorts of spirits, different kinds, any spirit. There's a corresponding demon for almost every sin and every problem. Jezebel, Antichrist, Death and Hades. And I'm briefly going to summarise these spirits. The first one is Jezebel. Jezebel was a woman in the Bible in 1 Kings chapter 16 through to 2 Kings, and she was in Revelation. Summarise the general range of spirits that are under her. Spirits of idolatry and false prophecy. She was the wife of King Ahab, and she set up idolatry in the nation of Israel. And she also killed the true prophets and set up false prophets. Spirits of religion, lying, slander, gossip, false accusation, murder, covetousness, theft. That's covetous is designing what belongs to other people. What happened was King Ahab wanted to buy a certain property from a guy called Naboth. Naboth wouldn't sell it to him. Ahab went back to his room and had a sulk. She said, it's all right, I'll sort it out for you. So she went and she took his seal, she signed it in his name, said, proclaim a fast, meet with the guy, put him in front of you, accuse him of blasphemy, stone him to death. That's what happened. And she's very religious, connected, very spiritual. Proclaim a fast. Spirits of feminism. Jezebel's spirit often works with the spirit of Ahab and men. Jezebelic men have a tendency to submit to their wives and pass off the responsibility of being prophet, priest, and king in their homes to their wife. They want their wives to mother them. And according to Bill Sobretsky, this is the practical expression of the feminization of God. And you find that, and she took a seal, was the symbol of his authority. She was usurping his role. And that is often the spirit that is behind that. Spirits of harlotries and witchcraft. When Jehu was anointed to replace King Ahab, and he went to go confront her, he was, someone tried to stop him, and he said, there shall be no peace as long as the harlotries of your mother Jezebel and her witchcrafts are so many. Spirits of seduction, flirtation, manipulation, and charm. She tried to manipulate Jehu as soon as she heard her coming, did up her hair, put on the makeup, put on the charm. He just flat out ignored her. Spirits of false prophetess, sexual immorality, idolatry, etc. In the church of Thyatira, this was the case. Jesus said, you tolerate that woman Jezebel, who calls herself a prophetess, teaches my people to commit sexual immorality, idolatry, etc. And the ruling spirit under Jezebel is deception. Next spirit is the spirit of Antichrist, primary manifestations of rebellion and lawlessness. It denies that Jesus is the Messiah, denies he's coming again in the flesh, opposes the preaching of the gospel, and it hates Christian music. Some of the spirits under Antichrist are spirits of abortion, anger, bitterness, blasphemy, corrupt communications, curses, dissension, that's divisions, drunkenness, revelries, Envy or hatred, fear, filthy language, frigidity, lack of faith, lying, malice, murder, nightmares, outbursts of wrath, poverty, rebellion, spirits of wretchedness, rejection, selfish ambitions, stealing, strife, torment, unbelief, unforgiveness, anti-Semitism. When you curse the Jews, make those jokes about Jews and burnt Jews. Marxism, Islam, and humanism. The last two spirits are death and Hades. Death is not just an event, and Hades is not just a place. They are spiritual beings that ride on the same horse. They are behind sickness, pain, plagues, breathing problems, spirits of infirmity, 
spirits of guilt, spirits of condemnation and fear, hopelessness, loneliness, darkness, depression, spirits of suicide, self-destruction, and spirit of a curse. There are curses from God in Deuteronomy 27 and 28. It's on the basis that Jesus became a curse that we still have to appropriate that freedom. And there are curses from other people in which we break the curse and we bless the person. Demons entice, they deceive. Derek Prince said, behind every form of deception is a corresponding demon. Any doctrine that detracts from the holiness of God or that attacks the person, nature, and work of Christ or undermines the authority of Scripture is demonic. They enslave and cause addictions. These addictions don't necessarily have to be sinful in and of themselves. For example, T.B. Joshua cast a spirit out of a little boy that drove him to bite his own nails. They torment, oppress, and harass. Jesus said, when you don't forgive others, talks in Matthew 18 about the servant who didn't forgive others. He was handed over to the tormentors, which are the demons. They drive and compel. Anything compulsive can be a demon. And this includes sexual demons that enter in the womb. For example, if your parents uh, practice fornication, sex outside of marriage, you can be born with that spirit in you and it will drive you to fornicate as you grow up. Same with adultery. There's a woman with that in her. Derek Prince dealt with. Spirits of murder and suicide. Murder enters through hatred. Murder begins in the heart, and that spirit doesn't enter you because you've murdered, it enters you to drive you to murder. Same with the spirit of suicide. Persistent and violent opposition to the truth of Scripture and the work of the Holy Spirit can be demonic. They defile, they attack the physical body. For example, they can cause um, they can cause extreme restlessness and talkativeness can be a sign of over, over being overly talkative, can be a sign of demonic activity. They can cause physical sicknesses, as I've established. They affect the psychological area through the thoughts of the mind. Doubt, unbelief, confusion, forgetfulness can be a spirit. Indecision, compromise, humanism, insanity. Usually those who rely on their mental abilities are those most open to this kind of demonic attack. They affect emotions, attitudes, and relationships. They affect the tongue. For example, lying, abusive, being abusive, dirty dirty jokes, unclean language, slander, criticism, and gossip, and the churchy kind. How demons enter? First of all, they enter through our own sin. When we step into willful sin, the Bible says there's no, there is no sacrifice for willful, continual willful sin and that you're treating the blood of Jesus as a common thing. You, can, you turn from willful sin, you'll be forgiven. But if you live to decide so you're going to continue in deliberate sin, you can be stepping outside the blood of Jesus. You need to confess it, repent, but even then often you still need to cast a spirit out. It doesn't mean a demon will always enter you when you do that. But they enter through the sin of our ancestors. They can be passed down. It talks about to the third and fourth generation. They can enter through idolatry, occult and witchcraft, heresies, basically distorting the truth of the word of God, Jehovah's, <coughs> Mormons, etc., all of those things. Transference. When you move with people who are not Christians, you know, you can, you're to associate with them, but when you yoke yourself to unbelievers, the Bible says don't be unequally yoked to unbelievers. Sometimes there can be a transference. When you, it says, do not set your, it says in Psalm 101, not to set our minds on anything evil. Things you watch in television, what you read, what you listen to, different things like that, there can be a transference. Don Basham dealt with a lady and the spirit entered her and said, how did this enter? And she said, well, when she went to that dirty sex movie, and the demon admitted to him, entered her through that. And also, it says in 1 Corinthians 5 that we're not to associate or fellowship with a brother. Anyone who calls himself a brother, who is a fornicator, an idolater, a drunkard, an extortioner, and I think one of the others there lists another thing. In other words, it's that willful sin. If your brother's living in willful sin, you're actually told not to fellowship him, as if he doesn't want to repent. And there can be a transference when you fellowship in a church, and there can be transference of spirits in a church, basically, especially even if people, if, especially if people in leadership are not right, not walking right with the Lord, there can be that spirit can go down through the church. There have been times when pastors have been caught in adultery, and the spirit of adultery goes all through the church. Laying on of hands. If you don't pray a covering of the blood, you can transfer it through that. Through our mind, through our thought life, such as fantasy, habits, idle words, marriage breakdowns, unforgiveness, rejection can enter in the womb, can be generational, can be self-rejection, rejection by peers, emotional shock and sustained emotional pressure and accidents. One spirit, spirit of epilepsy, entered a lady when she got hit on the head with a baseball. Derek Prince cast out. He still had to lay hands on her and close the entry point by praying for healing of the wound. Piercing the flesh. We've found so far without exception, we've anointed tattoos and demons have stood up and manifested and come. To be delivered, we come on the basis of what Jesus did at the cross. 
we must humble ourselves. If dignity becomes more important than deliverance, we have not really repented of pride. You never need to be ashamed of being delivered from demons. There is, however, one thing you do need to be ashamed of, and that's if you discovered you needed deliverance from demons, but pride kept you from acknowledging your need to be set free. We have to be completely honest, be willing to confess our sins, as it says in James 5, be willing to repent. We must break with the occult, and that includes destroying any occultic objects you have in your home or that you're wearing on you. We must submit to God and resist the devil, including after deliverance. It says we're to hate, hate God's enemies with a holy hatred. This is, that's referring to the demons. Total forgiveness required. We must honor our father and mother. We must call on the name of the Lord. And that includes sometimes when people do this, they cough out demons, because the word for spirit and breath in the Greek and Hebrew is the same. Often you'll cough them out or you'll vomit. Um, Sometimes that doesn't happen and the demon still goes. Some, but sometimes people choose to do it, and when they do it, the demon goes anyway. It's an act of faith. Deliverance is for the desperate, and if you're not desperate, come back when you are. So keeping our deliverance, we totally yield to Jesus Christ in every area of our life, making him Lord of every area. Um, be always filled with the Holy Spirit, <coughs> believe and live by the Word of God. And just one of the other things I want to... It's be often progressive, and I want to make the point that with things like water baptism... It says, he who believes and is baptized will be saved. When we, it's like in, with the nation of Israel, they were in Egypt, and the spirit of death went throughout the land, and they stayed in their houses under the covering of the blood. They were saved in Egypt. When they came out, they went through the water, and they were leaving Egypt. When you put your faith in Jesus, you're saved in the world. When you get baptized, you are separated from the world. It's the cutting off point, and the demonic powers don't have a legal right to follow you through the water. You must be baptized. Is it scriptural to talk with demons? When Jesus encountered the demoniac with legion in him, if you read that account in Luke chapter 8, the demons came up to him and, and said, have you come to torment us and all that? And Jesus apparently made no effort to stop them talking. He actually asked the demon its name. And it is scriptural and sometimes necessary to ask the demon its name, but there's only one practical end to that, and that's to get the demons out. That's all Jesus did. This incident cannot be used to justify conversing with demons for any other purpose. It is wrong and extremely dangerous to seek any kind of special revelation from demons. God has given us his, his Holy Spirit as our all-sufficient teacher and revelator, and to seek special revelation from a demon is to dishonor the Holy Spirit. Do you have to be totally free from demons to minister deliverance to others? One that has been saved through faith in Jesus Christ does not have to become perfect before he or she can testify about salvation and lead others into it. The same can be true in the ministry of deliverance. The basic requirement is simple faith in his word, as Mark 16, 17 says. And then finally, to sum it up, in Obadiah verse 17, it says, and this is the, I believe, is the, the key to inherit, it's stepping into our God-given inheritance. On Mount Zion, there shall be deliverance, there shall be holiness, the house of Jacob shall possess their possessions. Basically, there's a negative, which is deliverance, and there's a positive, which is holiness. All demons, and there's one thing they all have in common, they are enemies of true holiness. Unless driven out, we cannot attain to scriptural standards of holiness. Holiness is the unique mark of God and his people, both Israel and the church, Deliverance is only the first step in a process leading to the recovery of holiness and restoration of the church to her original simplicity and purity. There are three main channels of satanic supernatural power. They are divination, sorcery, and witchcraft. Of course, they derive from Satan, they come from Satan, and therefore they're evil. Divination operates by revelation. It's the fortune-telling realm and includes fortune-telling tarot cards, palm reading, even false prophecy in the church, um, in all those sorts of areas. Sorcery operates through objects or something that produces a physical impact or result. An example of this, like I said, with objects that people bring into their homes or wear on them that are occultic in origin or satanic in origin, and even things like certain bracelets. Derek Prince, this is one of the accounts of things I'm going to tell you, the experience he had a guy in his meeting came in with one leg shorter than the other, and he had a bracelet around his ankle. And he said to him, where did you get that bracelet? And he said, um, oh, my girlfriend gave it to me. He said, does it mean anything to you? He said, no. Um, does it mean anything to, you, to your girlfriend? I wouldn't know. 
He said, could it rep- in some way represent rebellion on the part of your girlfriend? And he said, it might do. So they asked him to take it off and the leg grew out. An example of sorcery through objects. In Revelation 9, when it talks about how people didn't repent of their sorceries, the Greek word is the word for drugs, mind-altering drugs, usually to deaden the rational mind and expo- open yourself up to that satanic realm. Those can be demonic. Bill Sabritsky commanded a spirit of marijuana to come out of a person. He had a word of knowledge, marijuana manifested and threw the person around and convulsed them and came out. Marijuana is demonic. P, cocaine, all those things. And then the last aspect is what we call incantations which includes certain forms of music and dancing. And you mentioned before how Satan had his pipes and his cymbals. Satan was, a lot of theologians believe Satan was the worship leader in heaven. Music's a very spiritual thing. You look at the Psalms in the Bible. God loves music, but music can also be, there's also the dark side of the, super, the spiritual things. And some forms of music are actually demonic. They're a form of sorcery. A lot of witches will use incantations, which is chants and music to cast a spell on people. And then there's also certain forms of dancing. Derek Prince, he was dealing with one spirit and a lady and stood up manifest and said, I am the seducer of the faith. And it had all these false teachings under it, things like you can't eat bacon and pork. And one of the demons said, I dance in the spirit. Derek said, I, I, don't, I, I dance before the Lord, but I don't dance in the spirit. Some forms of dancing are actually a form of sorcery. And last of all, there's witchcraft, which is the dominating satanic force that captivates, dominates, and controls. There's the supernatural and spells and curses, etc. And then open public, like Church of Satan and underground witches' covens. It also, it's also listed as a work of the flesh in Galatians. A work of the human flesh. There is a natural, supernatural part of witchcraft, and there's witchcraft in the natural that we all practice without even realising we do it. It says in 1 Samuel, that he said to Samuel, he said, your rebellion is as the sin of witchcraft. The root of all witchcraft is rebellion. Rebellion is the nature of, it's the primeval universal religion of fallen humanity, is rebellion. And when you have rebellion, it rejects legitimate authority. And when you reject legitimate authority, nature is, we, we need authority, so you re- replace it with illegitimate authority. And there are four main aspects of that. Control, domination, manipulation, and intimidation. We've all practiced it by second nature. Witchcraft is a work of the flesh. And with any work of the flesh, when you continually yield it to yourself, a spirit of witchcraft can enter you. And I've heard a really good example of, say, you know, you have a particular idea, and I'm, this is one I heard someone talk about, of what, who your children should marry, for example. They meet a particular race or class or whatever, and then they don't go for that. And you go, well, you're never going to be happy. They'll never be able to provide for you. And what you've done, you've put a curse on the person. You speak, curses come in your words. Basically, that's witchcraft is the work of the flesh, and one of the aspects is soulish prayer. Praying in such a way as to get people to do what you want them to do. Or even praying to try and get God to do what you want him to do. It's actually, it's actually witchcraft. And that's what Derek Prince was finding, is casting all these spirits of witchcraft out of people who hadn't even dabbled in the occult. And he asked God, he said, what is witchcraft? And God gave him that answer. 